Thanks for joining us online today. We hope you're blessed by this message. If you have a prayer need today, please visit our website, SiouxFallsFirst.com. Are you listening? We're all going to end up in the same place anyway. It's not stealing if it's offered free online. I just have way too much going on. I would do anything for an Apple Watch. But it was one little white lie. Who decided it was swearing anyway? I wish they'd just go die. Whatever path you believe in is fine with me. Nobody was around. I was just kidding. It doesn't really count. We didn't go all the way. You're just old school. I just don't have time to read the Bible. They always have the nicest stuff. Nah, I just rip it off Pirate Bay. You can rest when you're dead. It's just entertainment. I'm not hurting anyone. You should come hear my pastor. Must be nice to have that kind of money. But my parents don't honor me. Can't make it to church in the summer because we have softball games every weekend. There's just too much going on. OMG. I deserve it. It's not going to hurt anything. It was just given to them. It's not really cheap. I hate them. As they're giving, um, let me just uh, share with you. So we'll officially start now. Sorry about that. Um, Exodus chapter 20, and I'm going to be really transparent with you, is I've been studying and preparing and preaching this series. I realize how countercultural it is. I realize when we get to talk about some of the issues and the expectations of God, that it's completely opposite of what we're hearing on talk shows and in media and reading in magazines and reading in newspapers and reading on the internet. I understand that. And so even this morning as I begin to wake up realizing the brevity of bringing the word to you today, um, I was thinking about how, again, countercultural this message is. And I'm being totally honest with you what happened. I woke up this morning. I'm kind of in a fog I'm walking to the bathroom, getting ready to get in the shower, when I walk by the front door, which has a window pane right next to our door, and as I'm walking by, I hear this horrendous thump. I thought, what in the, woke me up, what in the world? And it was a big black bird that hit the window and fell to the ground. So I kind of peeked out there, and he's walking in circles. (laughs) Was alive, but walking in circles. And so I thought, man, that was strange, right when I was walking by. And um, so anyway, didn't think much of it, came to church, in worship this morning, first service, I felt like God spoke to me. He reminded me of the mother who was on the mountain, and the birds were coming, trying to eat at her dead children. And she was chasing the buzzards away. And you remember when Abraham prepared the sacrifice, And the buzzards were coming, and they were trying to come against the sacrifice of God, and Abraham was chasing the buzzards away. Here's what God spoke to me. I got you covered. He said, man, the buzzard, the enemy, may have an intention to discourage you or to uh, get in your head when you're preaching a message or a series like this, but he said, I want you to know because you're obedient, I'm chasing the buzzards away. They can't get in the house. They can't get in your head. They can't get in your people because you're being faithful to share what God wants to share to your people. And so you know what? We just open our hearts and say, God, speak to us, right? Amen? Exodus chapter 20, we're continuing our summer series called Top 10, in which we are looking at the Ten Commandments. And as we have been talking about the Ten Commandments, we understand that actions have consequences. And when a society tries to disregard consequences, we see that there is a sense of anarchy that begins to take over. That people begin to do what's right in their own eyes, and it's a dangerous place. So this morning, we're going to change the order up a little bit, because Pastor Tyler, our youth pastor in a couple weeks, is going to be sharing on honor your mom and your dad. Honor your mother and father. But this morning, I want to talk to you a few moments about Exodus 20, verse 13, which is the sixth commandment that says this, you shall not murder. Some translations, including the King James, renders the word kill. 
which really causes a misinterpretation of what God is really trying to communicate in this foundational moral code that he has outlined for society and for all cultures. You see, the Hebrew word in Exodus 20, 13 is ratzak. And it's referring to the unjustified taking of a human life or murder. You see, this gives defense to the skeptic's accusation that God created the standard and then violated it. Because he really didn't. In fact, they will say that he transgressed his own principle. For instance, when he told the nation of Israel to go into Canaan and wipe out all the inhabitants. Every single one of them. And yet as we really get beyond the, the one verse that so often is taken out of context. We have to look at the entire scripture. We have to look at the entire canon to get understanding of what God is saying. You see, the Canaanite society deserved its fate as they were thoroughly polluted by wretchedly evil practices, which not only included consulting the dead and mediums, casting spells on people, but literally also child sacrifice. They killed their own children in the names of their God. So there was no end to their wickedness. And yet God's judgment is always his last resort. You heard that this morning. That's not his desire. Remember when he waited, that he waited 430 years, multiple lifetimes, before he judged this Canaanite nation. You remember when Abraham pleaded for God, for Sodom and Gomorrah, for the sake of 10 righteous people. You remember that Noah warned of impending judgment upon a wicked people whose thoughts were continually wicked. That not only were they corrupt, but the Bible indicates they were full of violence. And yet Noah preached to them for 120 years before he flooded the earth. And then even after he flooded the earth, God was the one that created the rainbow. And he put the rainbow in the sky as a promise to humanity that he would never, never flood the earth again because his desire is loving towards humankind, towards mankind. That's not his desire. But some may ask in this process, what about the innocent people who are killed? And I'll be honest with you, it's a very difficult issue there's no easy answers, but again, as you look at the entire context of God's word, I believe God gives us some answers. In fact, do you remember when God ordered the Israelites, Israelites to eradicate the Amalekites because of their sin? Well, Saul, who was king at the time, claimed to have killed them all. He said, I did away with them all except the king. He was deceiving them. He wasn't telling them the truth. And because they didn't obey God, then it wasn't but a matter of years that these Amalekites came in to the camp and, and enslaved David and his soldiers' families and the women and the children, burned down their city. That when David came back to the city, he wept and he cried. His men wept and cried because of what had happened. But then it was several hundred years later that a descendant, a, a king of um, Amalekite, a king out Amalekite, a lot of words, by the name of Haman, he was a descendant of Haman, a descendant of um, Agag, that his desire was to have the entire Jewish race killed. Just read the book of Esther. So God wanted to prevent greater evil from happening in the future. God saw the big picture. God didn't just see in the moment, and sometimes we only process through the lens of the a moment, the lens of the immediate, God sees the much bigger picture. 
So we have to learn when we read scripture and we read it in the entirety of the context that we also understand that God's ways are above our ways and God's thoughts are above our thoughts. And God sees a picture and God, God sees a, a landscape that we don't always see. You see, the truth is that God always extends mercy to those who are willing to repent of their sin and turn from their wickedness. You read through scripture and every time God was pleading with them and, 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 and trying to get them to draw near to him. But he's also a God of justice. That he's not only a God of mercy, but he is a God of justice. And you know this very well that in our society today, we have a hard time of merging the concepts of mercy and justice. It's very hard for us to bring them together in our thinking and what we say and, and what's going on around us. And yet, they coexist perfectly. In fact, a philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas once said, mercy without justice is the mother of dissolution. Justice without mercy is cruelty. You see, the justice of God brings greater definition to the mercy of God. The justice of God helps us understand the mercy and, and, and the gift of grace that, is God, that God is giving us in a greater level. In fact, I will tell you, when you consider what's going on in the United States of America right now, you and I are recipients of the mercy of God, and we should be thankful to him for his mercy. His mercy that abounds. His mercy that is seen, not only in his church, but through his people. That God is demonstrating his mercy. You see, while God allows evil to take place, he also restrains evil and even brings retribution. In fact, I heard somebody once say that God keeps the books. You may think that somebody's getting by with something and, and, and evil is reigning. You remember when David said, why are the wicked prospering? Why are they doing so well? They're defaming you and they're speaking against your name and, and they're, they're following after false gods. And so many times God had to bring David back to perspective that he's the one that keeps the books. He is the one that keeps the records. You don't have to worry about it. Don't allow something to get in your heart. He is a God of retribution. He's a God of justice. You know, that's why he allows killing in times of war under the command of our superiors for the sake of our protection. That's why it says in Romans 13, verse 1 through 7, that our governing authorities are not to bear the sword in vain, but they are to execute wrath on those who commit evil and wrongdoing. So the question is, can a God of love also be a God of wrath? And I will tell you that even though people can't bring them together, absolutely, he can be both. Because all loving persons are sometimes filled with wrath precisely because of who they love. Because of the object of their love. For instance, if somebody came against your children or grandchildren to bring harm to them, you would not Continue in mercy. You would begin to operate in justice. And so God wants us to understand that he is both. In fact, the short-sighted skeptic needs to see the true nature of a loving God who is a God of mercy but is also a God of justice. Because if he was unjust, it would be hard to follow him. It would be hard to serve him, but he is a God of mercy, and he's a God of justice. And he poured out all of his wrath upon wicked humanity um, um, at the cross um, to a people who really deserved it upon a sinless son who didn't deserve it at all so that our sins could be paid for and we could walk in reconciliation with creator God. That's what he did for us. 
There is no greater love, Jesus says, no greater love than this, than one who lays down his life for his friends. That God demonstrated perfect love to us when all of the wrath of our sin, because of the justice of God, was given to Jesus Christ so that we could receive his mercy. Praise God. If you're away from God today, he's he's calling your name. If you do not know Jesus Christ and the love of God, he is speaking out to you right now. You may even feel uncomfortable in this service because the Holy Spirit is bothering you. It's a good thing. He's wanting to bring you to himself. Now, now that we understand the nature of God and really get a little bit uh, uh, perspective, I know we only skimmed the surface, but at least we spoke to... um, What is the nature of God? How does this commandment apply to us today? How does it relate to us? The first way I believe that this commandment relates to you and I today is that we are to value the gift of human life. God is the one who gave life to every one of us. And to every human being that has ever lived on this planet, God was the one that gave life to them. And God wants you and I to place at a premium the gift of human life. Unfortunately, especially in America, but even around the world, we are slipping on this. In fact, we may not be to a point where we are throwing individuals into crematoriums or gas chambers like they did during the Holocaust. But I will tell you that an apathetic attitude towards human life has quietly taken root in our culture. The seeds were sown in the first act of violence against human life when Cain murdered his own brother Abel in Genesis 4, verse 8. But as we continue to watch humanity progress, it seems like that we've switched the price tags. It seems like that which God has placed high value upon that he sent his son to die for that we have, we, have, we have put that in the discount section. And we've taken other things that are not as valuable to God and we've raised the price on them. That if we can look across the landscape of our culture and video games and movies and, and through social media and all these things how human life has not been valued. Even in our culture, we have allowed the killing of innocent and helpless people. We have watched this take place as we literally have snubbed God and said, God, you know what? The the gift of human life is really not that great of a gift. We've diminished it. And you see this radical change of mindset has caused us to permit or even sanction the murder of over 50 million unborn babies since 1973 in America. In fact, that is 3,322 babies per day who are denied their first breath. They are not allowed their first breath. I'm not not making a political statement. I'm making a biblical statement. You know, Ravi Zacharias says we've moralized politics and politicized morality needs to change. We need to get back to the instruction manual that God gave humanity to live by and live by it as a testimony to a world that needs to see the difference. You see, even though human life in in the womb, and and I believe that human life is devalued from the, 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 the womb to the tomb. And we devalue certain people, certain segments. We, we devalue older people. We devalue, you know, that, that's happening. It's because the core of who we are is that we've not valued human life like God wants us to value human life. 
And even in the womb, I don't care what society is saying. I don't care what culture is saying. They're loud. But the way we are able to navigate through culture is staying grounded to the truth of God's word. And it's a biological fact that human life begins at fertilization. When the sperm cell of the father penetrates the egg of the mother, that unique genetic code that we call DNA, something that we once were, contains everything about us. What color hair she will have. How big his feet will be. Whether or not he's going to be bald. Whether or not she's going to have dimples. At the very beginning, this DNA is this, is this person that God already knows who they are going to become. You see, we also know that the baby's heart begins to beat 18 days after fertilization. That brain waves can be seen in six weeks. That all body systems are present in eight weeks. And working by the 11th week. Man, when we really begin to remove ignorance from our mind. When we really begin to study. Because the Bible says that people die for what? Lack of knowledge. That we begin to grasp what David said in Psalm 139 verse 13 and 14. When he says, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. That it doesn't matter what person on this planet has lived, there's a deep-seated understanding that maybe you want to be ignored or rebelled against that God made them, and God made them for a purpose, and God knew them even beforehand to fulfill the purposes he has for their life. That's why it was so powerful this morning to be able to pray for these babies and their, their families because God has given them the gift of human life. All lives matter. All lives matter. And you know what? Even at conception, God adds a piece. It's an eternal piece. He, he adds the spirit to man. That part that will live eternally. That part that will live forever. That part that no man can snuff out. As true life really begins at conception. Don't buy into the lie that, that it's only in existence. It becomes a life after it comes out of the mother's womb. Don't buy into that. That's interrupting the process of God and really trying to take his place. Saying who deserves the right to live and who doesn't. God is the one that gives Life. That's why Paul declared in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. Human life is a gift from God, because every one of us and every human being that's ever, ever existed on this earth or will exist, God created in his very image. And because of that, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, it doesn't matter your age, or your gender, or where you come from, or what's behind you, or what's in your past, or what you're struggling with. God says all lives matter to him. And it's time once again that the church, the people of God, set the standard for valuing all human life. Respecting and honoring the gift of life that is operating in people. All life matters. So what else does it mean? It means that we also have to pull the weeds out of the heart. Now let me give you a little bit of understanding of what I'm talking about. You see, the value that we place on people starts in the heart. It starts right here. If you have issues that become outward, they've already been inward. They just become manifest. And so the, the value we place on life, on people, on people that may be different than us, on people that may have, be in a different generation than us, on people that um, have, have, have differences, it starts right here. It starts in the heart. That we value human life. But do you know what else starts in the heart? Murder starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. From the human perspective, we sometimes see murder as a physical act of taking another's life. 
However, God defines it in a much broader sense. When you cross the bridge into the New Testament, you understand that God sees murder as a thought or feeling of deep-seated hatred or malice against another person. In fact, it's more than a physical act, but it actually constitutes murder. 1 John 3.15 says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Why? Because you know what? When our heart has been transformed and God has placed eternal life in us, then automatically we gain the value of God in our life. So we're not going to murder physically, but also we're not going to murder internally. In fact, Jesus is speaking about this very commandment in Matthew chapter 5. He's speaking about not murdering, and then he talks about the liability or the judgment that comes when we take a life not justified. But they also parallels murder to things that proceed out of our heart. Anger, murderous anger, as words that come from our mouth that should never come from our mouth. Things like your life doesn't matter. I wish you were dead. Other kind of words that operate out of murder in the heart. Because you know what? Before murder ever becomes a physical act, assassination has already taken place in the heart. It's already taken place. In fact, um, I want you to think of it this way. We have watched the culture of violence in our nation increase. I have been absolutely stunned by some of the things I've seen come out that are really being embraced and and celebrated as we continually become more violent and and, and and the, the disregard for human life is so apparent in everything that's going on around us. You see why this is preaching uphill? You see why, do you see why the buzzard tried to come into this house today? Because he wants to keep you from receiving truth because truth sets people free. And we can't expect a world, a culture, a society, Hollywood to get free until the church actually walks in the freedom that God has for them. And, God, and, and, and the way to do that is, is establishing ourselves in truth. But we've watched some horrific things. I mean, I think to myself, how could they do that to their kid? How could somebody treat their spouse that way? As we've read story after story after story coming out um, in newspaper and news, and we're thinking, and, and, and every time we hear a crazy, crazy story, we're thinking, I think we've seen it all. And then another story comes out. And we're like, are you kidding me? Because this culture of violence and disregard for human life has become so prevalent today. And yet God has placed you and positioned you wherever he has put you for a reason. And that's to raise the banner that human life is valuable and it's important. We've watched some pretty horrific things. You remember in 2012 when a man by the name of James James Egan Holmes walked into a movie theater in Colorado. He gunned down 70 people killing 12. But do you know that murder was in his heart before he pulled the trigger? He didn't just wake up today and say, you know what? I'm just going gonna, gonna to do this today. There was something inside of him. Do you, you know, hurt people hurt people. And you know, brokenness in somebody's heart has the potential of manifesting. And it did. What about the Sandy Hook Elementary shooting by the, when a man by the name of Adam Lanza came into a school and we watched 20 children die and six adult staff members? It was horrible as all the nation in the world was watching, saying, how could somebody do this? And yet, murder was in his heart before he ever fired a bullet. We think of what happened recently in Charleston, South Carolina, horrific. 
when a man by the name of Dylan Roof came into a Wednesday night Bible study, sat through that service, and then pulled the trigger, killing nine people. We say, how, how could he do that? How could he sit there and watch these people? Do you know why? Because he already played out the scene before he ever made it a reality. That's what caused him to be able to sit there through that service and watch these people that he would, he would about kill, that he would take the life from, he would murder. You see, friends, they became guilty of a universal moral restriction. And while judges will hear their cases in a court of law and attach, attach consequences to their actions, a judge can never deal with the core issue. Because murder is a thought before it's an action. That's why it's not a weapon problem, it's a heart problem. Because you take the weapons, they're going to find a way. Because murder is in the heart. Murder manifests in the heart. From the heart. That's where wickedness comes from. That's where evil comes from. You see, we have to deal with the root of the problem if we're ever going to deal with the fruit of the problem. Because a rootless tree will die. A rootless tree will never produce fruit. So we won't see these things when the heart of America again becomes transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, the only surgeon who is able to operate on the heart of every human being, on the heart of a nation. That's exactly where we are going to see victory. It's not by legislating anything. It's not by trying to make something happen. It's not by trying to make statements. It's allowing God to come in and transform the hearts of people. That's what will change statistics. That's what will change the landscape. That's what will produce life. And that's why God tells us to value life. That's why he commanded us to value life. So would you pray with me? Father, we come.